Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Berkeley City College. We're happy to have you here this evening for the first of our spring series of science lectures presented by the science department here at Berkeley City College as part of the CERM speaker series. Um, I would like to welcome everyone for being here today. My name is Carlos Cortez. I'm one of the deans in the Office of Instruction, and I'm standing in this evening on behalf of our other dean who oversees science, who can't be with us this evening due to another obligation. But we're very pleased to have you here today. We hope that you'll continue to support Berkeley City's College investment in STEM education. Um, at this time, I'd like to bring forward instructor Peter Hahn, who's been an instructor in biology here at Berkeley City College since year 2000. Peter. Well, welcome to our uh, CERM seminar series. I forgot my other glasses, so I take my glasses off to read some numbers from the page. Um, the series are sponsored by the California Institute for Regenerative um, Medicine. That's called the CERM. And my colleague, Dr. Barbara de Rocher, received the prestigious grant from CERM. And this grant allows students in the biotechnology program to do paid internships at institutions like UC Berkeley, UCSF, and Cori, to mention just a few, to do research in stem cell fields. Tonight, we are joined by Professor Dennis Clagg. And Dr. Clagg is founder, professor, and co-director of the Center for Stem Cell Biology and Engineering Neuroscience Research Institute in the Department of Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology at UC Santa Barbara. Professor Clegg serves on an advisory board for the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine and the National Institutes of Health Center for Regenerative Medicine. He is co-principal investigator of the Californian project to cure blindness, a multidisciplinary effort to develop a stem cell therapy for AIDS-related macular degeneration. Dr. Clegg is the recipient of the UC Santa Barbara Distinguished Teaching Award in the Physical Sciences, the UC Santa Barbara Community Affairs Board Award, and the National Eye Institute Odysseus Goals Award. So it is with great pleasure to introduce Dr. Clegg. Thank you. All right, well thank you for that introduction and, and thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I thought what I'd do tonight is, is give you some general background about stem cells, different kinds of stem cells, where they come from and what they might be used for. And then in the latter part of the talk, go into some of the exciting research that we're involved in to develop ocular cells w from stem cells and use those in a therapy for age-related macular degeneration, one of the leading causes of blindness in, in the elderly. Uh, so my title is A Vision for the Future, Treating Blindness with uh, Stem Cells. And uh, there's our campus uh, right on the coast. Come down and visit sometime. Uh, one disclosure, I'm co-founder of a startup company called Regenerative Patch Technologies with Mark Humayan and David Hinton, where our goal is, is to develop a stem cell-based therapy for age-related macular degeneration. And I'll mention a little bit more as we go along. So to start out, I, I thought I'd start with a picture of, uh, for, of a newt for, for inspiration. Uh, here's a picture of a newt. And, and you know how it is when you go to develop a PowerPoint, you want an image, so you go to Google Image. And I went to Google Images and I typed in newt. And the first picture I came up with was, was this one. <laughs> and then I started thinking. I, I thought, well, here's Newt Gingrich, ran for president, powerful guy. Here he is on Meet the Press. But if you compare the Newt on the right here to the Newt on the left, the Newt on the left is actually, in some ways, more powerful. Because the Newt on the left can regenerate body parts after injury. If you uh, cut off the tail of the Newt, it can regrow. Uh, he can't regrow his tail. He doesn't have a tail, but he can't regrow body parts. And for some reason, over time, it, during evolution, humans have uh, lost the ability to regenerate tissues. And, and uh, here's just a time-lapse picture of a limb that's severed, and, and it regrows. Now, it's not identical to the original limb, but it's pretty close. 
and pretty amazing. It wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be great if we could figure out how to do that? And this whole discipline of regenerative medicine has that goal, to regenerate tissues after disease or injury. And of course, stem cells have a big uh, part to uh, do with that. And notice, even parts of the eye can regenerate in, in the newt. Um, so scientists have been studying the newt and, and looking at what happens. Here's just a, a video uh, of the regrowing limb. This is a pretty amazing process. This involves lots of different tissue types. This, this leg has muscles, has nerves, has bone, and they can regrow from that, that stump. And uh, close your eyes if you don't like blood. There's going to be some blood here. But um, scientists go in and, and surgically remove a leg, and then they can, um, <laughs> not real blood, don't worry. Uh, they can study this process of these cells that form here called a blastema that regrow. And, and individual stem cells uh, that represent those different tissue types amass here and somehow figure out how to regrow. So um, people are studying that and, and people are studying stem cells. And, and um, I thought I would start with a, an MCAT question. Anybody pre-med here? Anybody pre-med? Maybe oh, I see one right there. Okay. All right. Um, you're going to get questions on the MCAT, so I'm going to help you out here. And I don't see people didn't bring their blue books. No blue books so with number two pencils. So we'll we'll I'll ask for your answer orally. So here we go. You ready? All right. What is a stem cell? Okay. What does a cell have to do to be called a stem cell? Okay. Here are your choices. A a cell from the stem of a leaf. Uh, B, the latest cell phone from Apple. Or C, a self-renewing cell capable of differentiating into a specialized cell. What's your answer? C, very good. That's the correct answer. Although I think I would give full credit for A because that technically is true. Um, but no, to be a stem cell, a cell has to do two things. First, it has to be able to replicate and, and make more copies of itself. And then second, given a right uh, type of signal, it will change or differentiate into a specialized cell. So it may start out as a kind of round, generic-looking cell with a nucleus, and then differentiate into a specialized cell like a neuron or a muscle cell that looks very different. And of course, there are different types of stem cells. So-called pluripotent stem cells can give rise to most uh, all oops, cell types. My startup disk is full uh, in the body. And, uh, and then there are multipotent cells that can give rise to a few cell types. And I'm going to talk about these different types of stem cells. Uh, I'm going to focus on two types of pluripotent cells, embryonic stem cells and induced pluripotent stem cells. I'm not going to talk today about the somatic cell nuclear transfer cells. And then I'll mention briefly adult stem cells, multipotent, not quite as powerful. They can give rise to a few cell types. And both might be useful in developing therapies for disease and injury. So let's start with embryonic stem cells. Now, where do embryonic stem cells come from? And there's been some controversy associated with this field. And unfortunately, there is a lot of misinformation out there about where they come from. So to uh, explain that, we have to go back to basic developmental biology. How many are biology students in the audience, by the way? OK. Well, you all know this. Uh, Day one, sperm meets eggs. Egg you, egg, you go from one cell to two to four to eight, et cetera, and you form what's called a blastula. And this could be human development or mouse is very similar. <coughs> and then when you get to around day four, a little hollow space develops inside, and it's called a blastocyst. And then at day five, when you have about 128 cells, you see a first differentiation event where there's a cluster of cells sort of on the ceiling of this hollow sphere develop, and they're called the inner cell mass. Turns out those cells are what gives rise to the embryo. The outer cells in the sphere give rise to the extra embryonic tissues like the placenta. And then you go on day six and implant into the uterus. But that cluster of cells is amazing because it can develop into the three germ layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm, and then, of course, the germ cells. And ectoderm on the outside gives rise to skin cells, uh, neurons. Mesoderm in the middle gives rise to cardiac, muscle, 
for example, endoderm, then uh, pancreatic and lung, and then sperm and egg. All from that little cluster of cells, very powerful cells. Uh, that's where embryonic stem cells come from. Back in the 80s, working uh, on mice, the researchers were able to go in with a pipette and pull out these cells and uh, grow them in, in, a, in a dish and show eventually, as, as uh, methods got better, that these cells could make a whole mouse. So they, they called them embryonic stem cells. And they showed that you could grow these and expand these in culture. You can freeze them down, uh, thaw them out, grow them some more. And as far as we can tell, they can expand indefinitely. They're amazing uh, cells and they're pluripotent. They can make just about every cell type uh, in the body. And in the, in the case of the mouse, they've shown they're totipotent. They can make the whole mouse. Now, what about humans? Well, where do we get these blastocysts? It turns out that excess blastocysts are generated during the process of in vitro fertilization. And just to give you a, a, a little bit of background on uh, in vitro fertilization, uh, the first baby by this procedure was born in 1978, Louise Brown. And here she is right here with uh, Sir Robert Edwards, who won the Nobel Prize in 2010 for developing this procedure. And uh, there's her baby and her mother. At first, it was quite controversial and not all that successful. But as, as methods have improved, there's about a 30% chance of success now. And over 3 million babies uh, have been born uh, worldwide. Now, when they do this procedure, they usually uh, give the uh, female uh, drugs to cause superovulation. They collect maybe 20 eggs and add, add them to sperm and generate 20 little five-day-old blastocysts and then implant those, um, implant usually one or two into the mother. Um, and, but they have leftovers and they freeze down the leftovers just in case it doesn't work the first time. Normally just, uh, you know, one or, or two are implanted. I have a friend I play softball with. She had two implanted and she had twins. Um, unless you're the octomom, I think she had six implanted and had eight babies. But here's, here's the thing. You, you have these uh, frozen embryos in the U.S. and most will be discarded. So some parents have chosen to donate those to science and, and use those five-day-old blastocysts to generate embryonic stem cell lines. They're called lines because you can grow them up, freeze them, thaw them, grow them out, et cetera, and, and use them over and over again. So that's where uh, embryonic stem cells come from. Now, the first person to grow embryonic stem cells, uh, human embryonic stem cells, was Jamie Thompson at the University of Wisconsin. And here he is on the cover of Time magazine in 2001, the, the man who brought you uh, stem cells. And Jamie actually has a California affiliation. He's uh, part-time faculty at UC Santa Barbara, where he maintains a satellite lab along with his main lab in Wisconsin. Now, interestingly, Jamie worked in the Primate Center at Wisconsin. He was like an assistant researcher, and he figured out how to make the embryonic stem cells from macaque monkeys, and then he decided to try humans. People said, ooh, controversial, don't do it, but he went ahead and did it. And um, he told me that after his picture appeared in Time Magazine, he went from assistant researcher to full professor with tenure, so it's a good method to get promoted if you're interested. Um, Jamie has uh, been uh, a co-director of our center along with myself and Tom So and Pete Coffey and he's been an amazing help to get our stem cell program going at Santa Barbara. Uh, here's a picture from his uh, paper in 1998 when he reported that he could grow human embryonic stem cells and they're hard to grow and some of you have grown them in culture. They grow as colonies and so this is thousands of cells. There's a single cell there. They, they're growing on a bed of irradiated fibroblasts, uh, usually mouse embryonic fibroblasts. It's a little bit of an art form to, to grow them. And actually, I found evidence of that on the web in preparation for this talk. Here's a picture of stem cells. And you can see it's very similar. Maybe Vincent van Gogh was a stem cell biologist. Maybe he was trying to regenerate his ear. I'm not sure. Um, okay. Anyway, okay. So there's a very exciting new way to generate pluripotent stem cells that maybe you've heard about called 
induced pluripotent stem cells, or IPS cells. And, and Shinya Yamanaka, working in Kyoto, found in 2006 that he could take the tail of a mouse, cut it off, and grow those cells, uh, a boring old somatic cell, and by adding four genes, he could convert that fibroblast into a cell very similar to an embryonic stem cell, and he called them induced pluripotent stem cells. The genes shown here are normally expressed in embryonic tissue, but turned off in these adult cells. And he reasoned that if he could turn uh, the embryonic program back on by adding these genes, maybe he could convert these cells or reprogram these cells to uh, pluripotent state. And uh, he, uh, well, working um, further in 2007, showed that you could take a human and make iPS cells with the same cocktail of four genes. At the same time, same day, Jamie Thompson, working independently, showed with a slightly different cocktail of genes he could do the same thing. So now it's possible to take a blood sample or a skin sample, add genes, and make an embryonic-like stem cell called an iPS cell that's matched to that person. And it has a lot of potential and advantages. For one thing, at least on paper, it would be matched to the immune system of the person it was taken from, wouldn't be rejected. So if you could, let's say, Newt uh, gets Alzheimer's disease, you could take his skin, make an iPS cell, turn it into a neuron, put it back into him, and hopefully uh, treat him. So there's a lot of excitement about these iPS cells. So will iPS technology put embryonic stem cells out of business? There's less controversy, immunologically matched cells, but we're not sure yet. No one's uh, tried this, and just recently they've, for the first time, put iPS-derived cells into patients. And iPS are not perfect. They sometimes harbor genetic and epigenetic abnormalities. They have uh, mutations that arise and have different DNA methylation patterns, for example. And that may not be important, but it, it may also, in some cases, uh, affect your results. So, so at, actually, at this point, I think the FDA is actually more comfortable with embryonic stem cells than iPS cells, but I think we're going to see more and more as we go forward into the future. Uh, some people have asked, why do you use embryonic stem cells? Why don't you use adult stem cells and, and uh, multipotent stem cells? And for some things, they may work very well. And I want to just give a couple examples of, of adult stem cells. We have a number of cells in our body that are stem cells. For example, in our bone marrow, we have blood stem cells, uh, bone marrow cells. They can only make blood, but they're very useful in treating leukemia. That's been around since the 50s, so uh, bone marrow transplants. Uh, also, other places, we have cells that might be used in therapies. Um, bone marrow, uh, I mentioned, are already in use. People ask me, when are we going to have stem cell therapies? We've had stem cell therapies since 1955, when the first bone marrow transplant was done. Um, so uh, there are a couple different types of cells in bone marrow, the hematopoietic stem cell and also the stromal stem cell that are multipotent and can give rise to a number of cells. And there are a number of clinical trials. If you go to nih.gov uh, and, and look at clinicaltrials.gov, you can find a number of uh, clinical trials underway using these mesenchymal stem cells or stromal stem cells. Uh, so lots of possibilities there, but again, they can't make everything. I'm interested in the eye. You can't make ocular cells from these MSC. We've tried. Uh, you can make cartilage, bone, fat, muscle, uh, astrocytes, hematopoietic support cells, but not ocular cells. So good for some things and not so good for others. What about neural stem cells? Well, they're very promising as well. And one place they've been looked at is for spinal cord injury. This is a rat where surgeons have gone in and just pinched the uh, spinal cord with a forceps to induce a spinal cord injury, and the rat loses function in its hindquarters. And in this experiment by Evan Snyder and Robert Langer, they took a polymer scaffold with neural stem cells, adult human neural stem cells, and injected them into the spinal cord. And what you're going to see next is an animal treated with a uh, scaffold with cells 70 days post-injury. And look at the difference. 
So this is a very exciting result that's uh, stimulated a lot of research in the area of spinal cord injury. If we could uh, repair spinal cords with stem cells, that would be a great, great advance. And, uh, and there are clinical trials uh, ongoing um, to, to look at that. All right, um, another example of adult stem cells involves this guy. And uh, it's ski season, a storm's coming in, we might get snow, there's some snow up there. This picture was published in Science in 2003, and it's amazing, really, uh, for several reasons. First, this guy is uh, a racer, he's going 65 miles an hour down a ski slope. Second, uh, he's blind. Uh, this is Michael May, who was for many years the champion blind uh, ski racer in the world. But that's not the most amazing thing. The most amazing thing is that in one of his eyes, he was treated with corneal stem cells, and he regained his vision in one, uh, one eye. And this is something that goes on now in patients that have become blind because their cornea, the covering of the eye, is scarred. In his case, he was playing with some chemicals in his dad's shop when he was three years old, and a, an explosion occurred and he was blinded in both eyes. If you look at his eye, it just looks like the white of the eye over the entire surface. In 19, uh, so he's blinded at age three. When he was 48, he went into his ophthalmologist at, at UCSF, and they said, you know what? There's a new procedure. We might be able to save uh, vision in one of your eyes. And they transplanted both a cornea and, a, um, and corneal stem cells from a cadaver into his eye, and he regained vision. Uh, so when will we have stem cell therapies? Here's another example where we already have these. And, and uh, Michael May uh, lives in Davis, California, and here he is uh, today. He's kind of a wild man, actually. Uh, at the time he started racing, the blind skier would follow a sighted skier and kind of hang onto the poles. And he said, just let me go first. You ski behind me. Tell me when to turn right, when to turn left. And he went much faster than everyone, and he started winning all these uh, races. And there's a great book describing his, his experience called Crashing Through. Um, he has one story in there when he was 17. He was convinced that he could drive, even though he was completely blind. So he stole the family car and uh, made it half a block and crashed into a tree. Um, <laughs> interestingly, he says uh, that when he skis now, it's scarier because he can see. And he can't tell if these are bumps or shadows. So he just closes his eyes when he goes down. So um, amazing story. And here's just some examples of this transplant of corneal limbal stem cells, they're called. Before treatment, after treatment. Before, after, before, after. Look at that. Amazing that they can restore vision. These people have the machinery in the back of their eye to see, but no light can get through because of the scarring in the cornea. So they cut this part off, put in a cadaver cornea along with these stem cells, and amazing uh, work that allows people to regain vision using an adult stem cell in that case. So which cell is best? Embryonic, IPS, adult? And the answer is it depends what you want to do. Uh, and more research is needed. This is such a, a, a new field. We're really at an early, early stage uh, in this field of stem cell research. Uh, and everybody's excited about it. You know, you can devise, at least on paper, treatments for all kinds of diseases that maybe uh, we could treat using stem cells. And it's kind of like space exploration. Here's a picture I found on the web of the Mars rover. And look at these guys in bunny suits in a clean room making this. Here's the Weissman uh, GMP manufacturing, good manufacturing process, biomanufacturing. It's kind of similar, guys in bunny suits in, in a clean room. Here, except here they're growing stem cells. And in some ways, we're kind of at the early stages of space exploration in stem cell research. And they're similar in that it's a big, exciting area of science that attracts a lot of attention and requires a big team effort, interdisciplinary team that work together to develop uh, therapies in the case of stem cell research. And I'm going to talk a little bit about transplantation, stem cell transplantation. <laughs> And, you know, if you go on the web, you can find all kinds of therapies that use, quote, stem cells. You don't know what you're getting. Uh, and there are a lot of, there's a lot of hype out there, right? But uh, 
I want to just remind you all for a minute of the challenges that we face in stem cell transplantation. There are a lot of hurdles to overcome. One problem is when you squirt some cells in a patient, the cells may not survive. They may not integrate or function. And especially if you go into a patient with advanced pathology, with scarring, the cells may not make it. It's maybe too much to ask for a cell to go in and fix everything. Uh, second, if it's uh, an embryonic stem cell, or in the case of the skier, it was a cell from a different person. And the cells might be rejected by the immune system. Patients can take immunosuppressive drugs, but there are complications with those. IPS may be a way around that. And this is a big one that especially the FDA is afraid of. Remember, I said these cells can grow indefinitely. Uh, you don't want the cell to grow out of control once you put it in somebody and, and form a tumor. Uh, that would be a terrible result. So we have to have ways to deal with that problem. So a lot of challenges to, to overcome uh, in this field. And as I mentioned, you go on the web, you can find all kinds of crap. I mean, they're, and they look pretty good. Uh, I had dinner with a um, Parkinson's patient in, in Ventura where I live recently. And he came out with a brochure, and he said, look at this. This is in the Ukraine. I'm thinking of going to the Ukraine to get a stem cell injection. And, and he, I, I looked at the brochure, and I opened it up, and it was in Ukrainian. <laughs> I said, it's, I, don't, I can't understand it. And he said, well, but look, there's a nice picture of people in white lab coats and a nice bed, and uh, what do I have to lose? And I told him, you have a lot to lose, your money. Uh, you could get an infection and die. You could get a tumor. Uh, so you have to really be careful of the snake oil out there. And there, CIRM has a nice website now with links to uh, places where you can look up a company and see if they're reputable. And a lot of them are not. And, and as you know, it's been a political football. Remember this guy uh, back in 2001 when he limited stem cell research on embryonic stem cells in the US. And then along came this guy out of the surf. Uh, like, looks like Isla Vista in Santa Barbara. Uh, and he lifted the ban in 2009. But then along came a judge in Washington, D.C., Royce Lamberth, who s slapped on even more stringent ban in 2010, which was eventually overturned. So this, this makes it difficult to study. And this young lady at Harvard Medical School went in the lab one day and was told, oh, go home. Uh, you can't do any more work. We don't have any funding anymore. So it makes it hard to, to do embryonic stem cell research as this ball bounces around. Here in California, though, we had a different idea. And back in 2004, we passed Prop 71 to establish uh, the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, or CIRM. And here's the entire state made out of stem cells. We're, we're located about right here. Um, they're the Channel Islands. You can see. Uh, and CIRM has had an amazing effect uh, on uh, stem cell research in California. There are many clinical trials now beginning that have been funded by CIRM. And this Bridges program here is one example of the many, many students and postdocs that have been trained uh, using all kinds of different stem cells. And uh, I think we're just getting started. And people are going to look back in 10 or 20 years and say, wow, that CIRM thing was pretty amazing. Look at all these treatments we have. It's going to take a while, and it's going to be hard, but I think it's a, a great thing, and it's made California a world leader in stem cell research. Now, Geron, if you remember, back uh, uh, in, boy, I can't remember the year now, but uh, began the first ever clinical trial using embryonic stem cells, where they took human embryonic stem cells, converted them to oligodendrocytes, a uh, spinal cord type cell, and implanted some patients. But then they ran out of money. And uh, the new CEO said, we're going to stop the trial. Fortunately, uh, they showed that there were no adverse events, no tumors that grew, but you know, no, no miracle uh, cure uh, at that very first trial. Now, Geron has reformed as Asterius, and uh, they're uh, they just recently reported the results of that first trial, and they're going on to do more trials. And hopefully, they'll get results you know, like the rat I showed, where these, these cells will go in and help patients with spinal cord injury. 
But it's a tough trial, actually, for spinal cord. And, and I wanted to point out uh, in the end here what we're doing in the eye, because the eye actually has a lot of advantages compared to other tissues. Uh, there are advanced surgical methods to get into the eye, non-invasive imaging to look at the retina in the back of the eye without cutting or anything like that. And it's good endpoint parameters to tell if it's working. Not only can you have people look at a visual chart, but you can use advanced methods to measure exactly what part of the eye is working. And we only think we'll need a small number of cells. You know, in that spinal cord trial, they were injecting millions and talking about billions of cells, just squirting into the spinal cord. They have no way of following them, and it's hard to tell if it's working. In the eye, we think we can use 100,000 cells, and we can image them after transplantation. So that's gotten the attention of a lot of uh, companies and, and uh, academic groups and, and funders that have started to move forward for cellular therapies for ocular disease. I'm going to talk about age-related macular degeneration, and if you went into the eye doctor and he said, read that chart, and you saw something like this, you might have uh, this, this disease. It, it comes on in o older uh, patients. It's one of the leading causes of blindness in people over the age of, of 55, and it results in this loss of the central visual field. And that's probably the most important part of your vision. If you look out at a scene, you might be missing that central part of your visual field. And that's where you, you do fine acuity vision. If you're threading a needle or reading small print, you're using those cones that are focused, uh, that are, are, are condensed right in the middle of the back of the eye and the retina. Now, we know a little bit about what causes it in, in, we think, most cases. There may be multiple types of this disease, but we know that there's a cell type in the back of the eye called the RPE, retinal pigment epithelium. And it's a support cell for the photoreceptors, your rods and cones. You can actually see the RPE if you look into your neighbor's eye and you look at the pupil. The pupil is black because you're looking at this monolayer of pigmented cells behind the retina. And they're key support cells for the photoreceptors. And when the RPE die, the photoreceptors die soon after. There's evidence of, of a sort of autoimmune chronic inflammatory state that it develops in some patients. Uh, there's evidence for loss of attachment or accumulation of toxic byproducts. And when these RPE die, um, the photoreceptors die. Okay, here's your second question. You all did pretty well on your first MCAT question, but now we're going to go to a more difficult uh, question number two. Uh, are you ready? Okay, uh, it's called macular degeneration. What is a macula? Here are your potential answers. Think carefully. A, the newest version of the Macintosh computer. B, a Scottish cousin of Count Dracula. Um, or C, the central most part of the retina responsible for detailed sharp vision. What's your answer? I like that one the best, too. I think that's a, no. Uh, no, the, uh, that's what it is. It's a part of your retina. And that's the part that does that central vision. And for some reason in this disease, that, that's where the cells start to die. And here's just a schematic. The, the retina is this yellow layer back here. And it's a little circular area, one-tenth an inch in diameter uh, in the fovea called the macula. And it's chock full of cones. And for unknown reasons, that's where the RPE die. If we look at a, a, a fundus photo, it's called, when you go into the optometrist or ophthalmologist and they hit you with that bright flash, which I, I hate, um, they're taking a picture of your retina. That's what a normal retina looks like. Early AMD, you can kind of see these spots. Let's see if I can just turn this down for a minute here. Um, these are called drusen, little yellow spots. And this can progress to two forms of the disease. One's called the dry form. That's most patients, 80 to 90 percent, looks like this. The other's called the wet or exudative form, where you actually get improper growth of blood vessels and bleeding. This one's really serious. You can go blind very quickly if you have a bleed. Fortunately, there are drugs to treat this. Uh, Avastin, Lucentis, and Ilea are uh, available to stop that blood vessel growth. But this form, nothing really 
that's out there for treating it. And what you're seeing here is a, an area they call geographic atrophy, where the RP cells and the photoreceptors have died, and, and as a result, you're lacking the central vision that they were responsible for. So that's uh, the form that, that we're interested in, in going after in our therapy. And just to show you a little bit more of the eye anatomy, if you zoom in on the retina, the retina is a beautiful layered structure of, of cells. And as I said, right behind it is this monolayer of pigmented cells, right next to the uh, outer segments of the rods and cones right here. I think I have a cartoon that shows this a little better. Uh, a little simpler. Here's the RPE and here are the rods and cones. And they, they have this uh, polarized structure with tight junctions and apical microvilli that interdigitate between the outer segments. And they're key support cells for those rods and cones. Um, if they die, then the photoreceptors follow in about six weeks. And we think, in most cases, that causes macular degeneration. So why do we think uh, stem cell therapy might work? Well, here's the, here's the rationale. Very simply, RP cell death causes the disease. We know we can make RPE from both human embryonic stem cells and iPS cells. They can be turned into RPE cells. So the idea is go in and replace those cells while you still have photoreceptors. And replace the support cells so you keep your photoreceptors alive and prevent that loss of vision. Okay, and, and in fact, uh, there's actually a clinical trial underway and one report that's come out from the group at Advanced uh, Cell Technology, actually they changed their name to Okada, uh, led by Robert Lanza, and they reported in The Lancet recently that if you just take a, a, a suspension of RPE cells and inject them, they, they saw no safety problems, no tumors, and, and maybe um, some kind of signal in a couple of patients. Uh, they've reported on two patients, but then more recently they've reported on uh, a number of others. And um, the improvement in visual acuity is very small, and it's debated as to whether it's significant. Other trials are using a different approach, uh, and I'm going to talk about that, and that's uh, what we're doing to follow on to this first uh, pioneering uh, work. The question is, how do you deliver the cells? You could just inject a suspension of cells into the space and hope that they interdigitate and function, or you could grow them as a monolayer, a graft, basically, and implant them already differentiated and uh, on a scaffold. Uh, we're taking that second approach uh, because we've tried injecting suspensions, and here's what happens. This is in a rat. Uh, transplanted RP, these are derived from IPS cells. They form these clumps, these clusters here. The green color is a human-specific marker, and so those are the human cells. And they're not oriented the way normal RPE are. Normally, it's that sheet and they're the apical microvilli are able to phagocytose the outer segment bits that are shed off. And we don't see that working very well when we inject clusters. And in fact, most of these cells disappear. They die uh, because they don't have anything to attach to. Uh, and, and that death of, of a cell that's not attached has been known for some time. It's called uh, anoechus, which is the Greek word for homelessness. And if a cell is not attached to an extracellular matrix, and bound via integrin receptors, it, it kind of, um, you know, blebs up and undergoes apoptosis or cell death and, and dies. And that may be a real roadblock to cell transplantation. So our approach uh, is to give them a scaffold. If you think about where we're putting these in, here's geographic atrophy. Um, and this looks like a fundus photo, but that's actually the surface of Mars. And and, and the point is, this might not be a very good place to put cells. Uh, inhospitable territory, it might be too much to ask the cells to survive when you put them into a diseased eye. So we started the California Project to Cure Blindness, and, and uh, I'll finish up with some uh, data from our, our studies. It's funded by CIRM. It's one of the disease team grants. 
It's headquartered at USC and led by Mark Humine, who's an MD, PhD, retinal surgeon, and myself and David Hinton, our co-PIs. At Santa Barbara, we figured out how to take an embryonic stem cell and turn it into an RPE cell in very, uh, very uh, high yield method and, and no contaminating cells. We collaborated with Caltech where they developed a scaffold to put the cells on. It's actually a biostable uh, polymer of xylene that's already approved for use in the eye and very biocompatible. Uh, University College London was funded in parallel by the MRC developed imaging methods and City of Hope is our manufacturing place. They're good at making cells under what's called GMP, good manufacturing process, and for use in clinical trials. And then this startup company, uh, we hope will eventually move this further to phase uh, one, two, and three trials. Here's our approach. You take the HES cells, the human embryonic stem cells, turn them into RPE, grow them on this scaffold, to the point where they're differentiated, mature, polarized with basal apical side, look like real RPE in the scanning EM with these apical microvilli here. And it's gonna be a three by five millimeter patch, about that big. Imagine like a little piece of contact lens that you're gonna coat with stem cell derived RPE and have the surgeons implant that in the back of your eye to replace RPE cells that are dying. We've tested this out in a rat model and here's uh, one example where we got really nice placement in the subretinal space. Here's the blow up. There's the perylene, which is the xylene polymer scaffold. Here's the human RPE cells, nicely opposed to the endogenous rat photoreceptors. And that's one week after transplant. How do you know if it works? Well, you can't you know, show a rat an eye chart and say, what are the letters? But you can do this. It's something called the optokinetic response put a rat in a box and make these bars go by and watch the rat's head. When the green bar appears, the rat is tracking those bars. That tells you that his eye is, is working and the, and the rat has vision and not only that, but the retina is hooked up to the brain. Um, somebody asked me if this rat was on drugs. Uh, nope, nope, they just do this. You can try this at home if you have a pet rat. Um, if you put a, a blind rat in the same uh, contraption, you'll see that, that the rat does not respond. And we're using this model called the RCS, Royal College of Surgeons Rat, which has a mutation in the RPE, and the RPE don't work. So our proof of concept is to implant in a, in a rat uh, our patch with the three by, well, it's smaller in the rat, but with the HES-derived RPE, and see if we can rescue the photoreceptors. So here's just one example of a blind rat implanted with our stem cell based therapeutic. And you can start to see some tracking. It's not as good as, as the wild type, but we can now slice that eye through and stain it and see rescue of the photoreceptors. So, so that's a proof of concept of efficacy. But of course, a rat is, is different uh, than a human. And the idea in the human would be you would go in, cut a slit in the side of the eye, uh, remove the vitreous. The, the stuff in the middle of the eye, the goo in the middle of your eye, and then inject some fluid to lift the retina away from the RPE and make a little blister. Go in and make an incision there, and now you can insert in the scaffold with the cells, like that. That's the idea. And uh, to work that out, we've started experiments in the pig, because the pig eye is about the same size as a human eye, and this is an actual surgery performed by Rodrigo Brandt, who's a surgical resident with Mark Humayan. <coughs> and what you're seeing is removal of the vitreous in the middle of the, the eye. They're just making a movie through the lens. They're injecting fluid there to make uh, a blister. And what you're gonna see next is our implant sitting on, on top of the eye. Oh, they cut a little hole in the retina. Here's our implant. And key to this was the development of a surgical tool where we could pull this implant inside a cannula and it folds up kind of like a taco and protects the cells. And then that can be inserted through the side of the eye, through that little hole in the retina. And then the scaffold plus cells can be extruded where it unfolds in the back of the retina. And the idea again is to deliver it where you've lost RPE cells to replace those cells and hopefully preserve 
uh, the photoreceptors. Now, I, I don't know about you, I get a little nervous when anybody puts a sharp object near my eyeball, but uh, the surgeons are very skilled and they do this kind of thing to repair, for example, a retinal detachment. And uh, they think they can do this in about a one hour outpatient procedure. And there's, there's our implant in the uh, pig. So where are we? Well, we've uh, completed our, our uh, production of cells now at uh, City of Hope. We transferred our protocols from Santa Barbara to City of Hope. And we've made a, an intermediate cell bank enough for our phase one clinical trial. Next step is to you know, get the surgical tool, the scaffold, every, everything up to snuff and apply to the FDA in what's called an IND, Investigational New Drug Application. And I'm happy to say that today we submitted a 3,400 page document to the FDA to ask permission to uh, put this into 20 patients in a phase one safety trial to make sure it's safe. So we're hoping to go forward. Uh, we'll hear back from the FDA in about 30 days. Now looking forward, and this is a, a painting I found in Bruges in Belgium, early ophthalmologist. Actually, for you future doctors, this is really a bad idea. If you're sticking a sharp object in the eye of a child, you should not be looking at the painter. <laughs> um, but he's looking forward. And, and looking forward, so there are a lot of people out there in this space that are carrying out clinical trials on the eye. Remember I said it was a good thing to do cellular therapy and because of all those advantages. Uh, suspension, RPE, I mentioned, Okada, that's phase one. They're hoping to go to phase two. They did dry AMD and Stargard's patients. Uh, a company in, in Israel is following suit. Uh, other people are trying different cell types, neural progenitors, Stem Cells Inc. in Menlo Park. Uh, Janssen, uh, sub subsidiary of J&J, uh, &J is trying mesenchymal stem cells in a phase one trial. UC Davis, I just heard this recently, has tried autologous bone marrow cells in uh, the vitreous. A lot of different approaches. The very first IPS are, have been put in patients, three patients in Japan. IPS RP as a monolayer, similar to our approach. And uh, we're down here. Um, we've completed our IND enabling studies, they're called, and, and we hope to move to a clinical trial. So it's kind of, again, it's kind of like the early phase of the space program. Here are all the Saturn V rockets from 1967 to 1973. A lot of different approaches to get to the moon. And I think we're at that same stage now. A lot of different ideas that, that may work, may not, and, and some may work better than others. And, and it's a very exciting time. We're going to see pretty soon, in the next few years, uh, what hopefully will bring relief uh, to patients with macular degeneration. And hopefully someday we'll be a little bit more like the newt, where we can regenerate body parts after injury and disease. So I'd like to finish just by acknowledging the, the tremendous uh, team of smart people at all those institutions that worked really hard to get that IND together over four years. There's Mark Humayan uh, who, who led us and will carry out the phase one clinical trial at USC. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, especially Sherry Hikita who uh, was a project scientist in my lab that led the production of the cells. Uh, uh, Link Johnson, my collaborator, and really important our funding from the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine and other sources. So uh, thank you for your attention. I'll stop there and be happy to take questions. This, this procedure was developed in the 90s. So they usually take a cornea, just cut it off from a cadaver donor eye, and then add uh, the stem cells, which come from the side of the cornea. They're called limbal stem cells to help uh, secure the, the cornea and, and keep producing the cells with time, especially if those have been lost in the patient. Um, and w did he have a good outcome? Was he able to? Uh... Well, he's got a CD and what he's done? Yeah, so he's repaired uh, his cornea, which is the outside surface of the eye, but may still have you know, deficits that arise in another tissue in the retina. And that's what happens with uh, macular degeneration. It's an RPE problem. If you put corneal stem cells back there, that wouldn't help macular degeneration because they can't make RPE. So um, 
you know, they, maybe they, they see that early stage of macular degeneration developing in him when they, when they do that fundus photo, they see drusen. So, uh, and, and you can go in, a little bit of drusen is, is normal in aging eyeball, um, but in the disease you start to see more and more and, and there's an effort underway now for clinicians to really standardize exactly how they characterize those. I mean, there's soft drusen, hard drusen, pseudo drusen, uh, basal laminar deposits. There are a lot of different names. And they're trying to, to really figure out what are the stages in the disease, when would it be appropriate to intervene. You know, maybe early detection would be a way to go, especially if we have a good uh, stem cell therapy to replace cells. You want to go in as soon as you see it developing and, and hopefully nip it in the bud and, and replace the RP and, and keep the, the photoreceptors alive. So, so that, that's probably maybe what's going on. Ah, where does my passion for eyeballs come from? You know, it, it, um, um, my background was, you know, I wanted to be a, an outdoor biologist. I loved, uh, I wanted to, I grew up in Minnesota and loved to watch birds and hike around the woods. And, and then I started thinking about, and I liked animal behavior, and then I started thinking about, well, where, where does behavior come from? It comes from the brain. And, uh, well, how does the brain work? Well, it's the cells in the brain. So I've been interested in neurobiology for many years, and the eye is really an extension of the central nervous system and the retinal tissue, and it's the easiest part of the central nervous system to study because it's right there, anatomy's well known, and a lot of studies have been done. So uh, when I set up my lab at UC Santa Barbara 26 years ago, I decided to focus on, on the retina. There are also other groups working there on the retina and they have a rich history of retinal research. And you know, the, the vision is so important to, to everybody, right? And, and uh, I've met so many uh, patients with various diseases of the eye, and, uh, and it's, it's, uh, it would just be great if, if we could help those patients. Um, Sherry Hikita, the project scientist that developed the method, wrote a, uh, an essay, and she described the patients as her jet fuel. You know, that's what keeps her motivated to keep coming back to the lab to try and figure out how to do this. Well, in the, in the case of the pig model, there's no good way to, to do uh, an efficacy study. They don't do that head tracking. You can't really measure visual acuity very well in a pig. Um, so what we're trying to show there is that we can deliver it uh, reliably. So those pigs were only followed for about a month, and then uh, they were sacrificed and, and sections were cut. And what we showed was that tool worked really well, and we could deliver a nice flat implant in the right place, and it would stay, stay there and not move around. So, yeah, good. I, that was my question. I went and watched a pig surgery, and I asked the surgeon, can the pig see now? And, <laughs> and he said, we, we don't know. There's no way to really measure that in a pig. Occipital load damage, yeah, which it, you, can, you can lose your visual um, function by damage to the brain, because once the eye hooks up to the brain, there are many, many places in the cortex that are involved in visual perception. And uh, I, 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 I'm not aware of, of, of any research. You know, there, there are ongoing efforts to make brain cells, looking at Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, et cetera. But those are more rare, and, uh, and, and a big challenge in that field is how do you make the right type of brain cell? You know. What is that cell? And then, of course, if you put that cell in, is it going to make all the right connections? Because a typical brain cell has about a thousand synapses with a, other other brain cells, and that's still unknown, you know. And, and uh, again, it depends maybe on the pathology uh, and uh, at what stage. Uh, one amazing result, which maybe bodes well for that, is that they have been able to transplant photoreceptors in mouse models. And a lot of people thought, no way, the photoreceptor can't connect. You know, it's too complicated. But they show in, in a couple studies coming out of University College London and uh, University of Washington that the transplanted cells can function. So maybe someday we could, we could do that. Yeah, part of the procedure is actually to create a, a detachment. When you inject that, that um, fluid and make a bleb, you're detaching the retina. And, uh, and so we have to reattach. And, 
In the case of the pig, we were injecting uh, oil into the vitreous to put pressure and push the retina back against the back of the eye. In the case of human patients, what's typically done is to put a gas bubble in the vitreous. And uh, it sounds uh, really uncomfortable, but they make the patients lie down and look down for four days. And the bubble pushes back on their eye and reattaches the retina. But they make special chairs so you can like watch TV or read a book. Uh, and uh, they get good compliance, and that works. So, so we, think, um, we think that we can, we can deal with that. Um, Stargard's disease is, is uh, a disease that is caused by mutations in the photoreceptor, and it, it results in the photoreceptors uh, dying and the RPE get poisoned by these uh, bad photoreceptors. So in a disease like that, you kind of need two layers. You need new RP and you need new photoreceptors. And <coughs> we've started a collaboration with uh, David Gam's lab at the University of Wisconsin. They're good at making photoreceptors. We're good at making RPE. What we're trying to develop is a scaffold with RPE and then a layer of photoreceptors. So you'd have a bi-layered uh, construct that could be implanted in Stargard's patients, perhaps, or in retinitis pigmentosa patients, uh, or late-stage uh, macular patients that have lost their photoreceptors. I think that's going to be uh, a real uh, holy grail, tremendous advance. Uh, there's so many patients that would benefit from that. The challenge is it's easy to make pure RPE. We figured out how to do that. You can make 99% pure RPE. You can't make 99% pure photoreceptors yet. They can make about 20 to 40%. And <clears throat> when they try and purify them away from the other cell types, they get damaged. So uh, the GAM lab and, and others, uh, Robin Ali's group at um, University College London, are going forward trying to figure out a way to make photoreceptors reliably and make them in high yield and, and high purity. And, um, and we're funded by, in that project, by the Foundation Fighting Blindness, and we're using IPS-derived RP and IPS-derived uh, photoreceptors. So, I think those are under development and still a few years away, but I think uh, there, there's some very promising uh, preclinical research in that area. This, it's this uh, polymer uh, uh, called, um, called perylene. It's made of xylene, um, and it's USP class 6, which is the, the highest biocompatibility rating. They use it in a variety of uh, medical applications, for example, if you have a stent put in, you know, between a in, a, in a blood vessel, it's usually coated with perylene because the, the body doesn't reject it and it's uh, very uh, inert, doesn't uh, cause a foreign body reaction, which sometimes a transplant will cause. And uh, it's already approved for use in the eye. Uh, Dr. Humayun, our PI, has developed this amazing thing called an Argus II, uh, where uh, he implants an electrode array into the retinal ganglion cells and hooks that up wirelessly to a camera that patients wear. And it uh, allows the images that they see in the camera to be uh, transmitted through this electrode array. And it allows patients that are completely blind to regain some vision, very rudimentary vision. It's already approved by the FDA and available. And in that case, everything's coated with perylene. And they've gotten good results there. Thank you.